Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Why is he telling them don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth? Because they're not going to last. It's not simply that it's the wrong thing to do. It's the stupid thing to do. But Jesus says, turn it around. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Then if you know me, you're going to heaven. Then every day of your life, if your treasures are in heaven, you're getting closer to your treasures instead of moving away from your treasures. He who spends his life moving away from his treasures has reason to despair. He who spends his life moving toward his treasures has reason to rejoice. This life is just a dot. And from that dot extends a line and that line is gonna go out forever. We all live in the dot, but if we're smart, we're not gonna live for the dot. We're gonna live for the line with the people of God. God who will live forever, people who will live forever, His Word which will live forever. So live your life now while you're in the dot, in light of the line, investing in the line. What's gonna matter after you die? Amen. Live for the line, not the dot. I have a bookmark in the book I'm reading right now which says exactly that, that I got from you. Uh, I'm Kirk Cousins, went to Holland Christian, graduated in 2007. Uh, this is Randy Alcorn. Randy's here with his wife, Nancy. Nancy's somewhere. But uh, uh, I, I have attended Livingstones many times, and um, you know, I believe so much in this school, as many of you know. Had a phenomenal experience here. And um, I just had the idea driving by the school last summer that you know, we need to get Randy Alcorn here. And uh, Randy's had a big impact on me. Uh, I read his book, Heaven, when I was in college, gave a talk at Michigan State on heaven as a result of what I learned from his book, and then uh, met him at a conference for NFL players. That's a Christian conference every offseason. Met him at the conference. He was in a small group with me with a bunch of quarterbacks, and I've uh, uh, just continued that relationship ever since. He has a very unique thing that people don't know about. Um, there's about 25 NFL quarterbacks that are on a uh, website together where we can post and Randy will post thoughts, devotionals, uh, you know, excerpts from his writings, and we'll post back and, and comment and pray for one another, and so it's a really cool thing that he basically helps lead and spearhead. So um, we've kind of kept in touch through that, and I'm just thrilled that you're here tonight, so thank you for being here, Randy. It's a pleasure to be here, Kirk. We uh, uh, wanted to talk about uh, a couple of topics, and one being stewardship, obviously, uh, is a big part of what this school is all about and what your ministry is all about, Eternal Perspective Ministries, but also uh, wanted to address heaven, because the concept of heaven, after I read your book, I realized there are so few resources that go into it in the detail that your book does, and it was so informative and so helpful. And I also want to talk about happiness for a second because your uh, book on that and your teachings on that to me at PAO were very impactful. So I'll start with heaven and then we'll work our way over to happiness and stewardship. But uh, to start, you know, when I read your book, you made it clear how the Bible says there's a present heaven that when we pass, that's where we go. But there's also going to be a, a future heaven. Can you kind of explain that to me? Because that was a new concept. Can you explain mm -hmm. that uh, to the audience? Yeah, the, uh, the pr first of all, it's great to be here and uh, a pleasure to be at uh, Holland Christian School and believe in what you're doing. Got the tour today from Troy and looked at uh, online. My wife Nancy was saying, that's an amazing website. This looks like a terrific school and you all already knew that. And, uh, but it, it's a pleasure to be here with you and I hope that this uh, can make a difference in your life. Uh, yeah, w there, present heaven and future heaven, and sometimes people go, well, wait, wait a minute, wait, you mean like heaven's going to change? Well, what is heaven? Heaven is the dwelling place of God. Heaven is the place where God's throne is. It's, it's the site from which he governs the universe. Now, God is everywhere present. We, we know that. He's omnipresent. So how is it that he's in one place in a particular way? Well, heaven is the place where God dwells specially with his angels and with his people. So the present heaven uh, is what theologians sometimes call the place that uh, we go when we die. If we know Jesus, you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you've been saved by grace through faith, you die, you go to heaven. But the heaven you go to is indeed where God is, 
and where God's people are who have died. But something critical has not yet happened. And that thing probably comes to your mind. That's the resurrection. And so the present heaven is the place where our spirits or souls, sometimes we call them, go when we die. Uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, it's better by far to die and be with Christ, Paul says. And that's the present heaven. But the Bible teaches that the present heaven is one day going to be relocated. It's going to be taken to a different place. And that different place is spoken of very specifically in Revelation um, 21, where it says... Um, how about his Bible, by the way? While he finds it, I just can't get enough of that. I give him a hard time about it. That's a life goal of mine, that my Bible looks like that. Uh, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven, first earth had passed away. But then uh, God brings down from heaven something new. Verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is, it will be from that point forward, and this is in the resurrection, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So three times it says God is going to bring the present heaven down to earth, because that present heaven is where he dwells. It says his dwelling place is going to be on the new earth earth with us. So now when we die, we go home to be with the Lord. We go up to live with God in his place. But the great promise of scripture is that one day after the resurrection, God is going to bring heaven down to the new earth where he will dwell with us. So that the ultimate goal of scripture is not simply that we would go up to live with God in his place, wonderful as that is, but that God will come down as the forever incarnate Jesus Christ with his throne on the new earth, we're told in Revelation 22, to dwell with his people forever. So the special dwelling place of God will be on the new earth. So God will actually come down to live with us in our place for all eternity. That changes everything. That's a paradigm shift because then all of the biblical statements about resurrection make sense and all the references to animals on the new earth and the references that Jesus made eight times that we will eat and drink together in God's kingdom. Well, Jesus says that Scripture tells us that our bodies are going to be like his. And so his res resurrection body, what happened when he ate and drank with the disciples? Did like the food and drink just spill out down onto the ground? No, he had a real actual body. We are going to eat and drink at feasts and enjoy the pleasures and wonders and beauties of a resurrected earth for all eternity. So that's the future heaven. And when you get that in your mind, then you get excited because then you don't have to have a bucket list. Because forever we will be able to enjoy the wonders of God's magnificence and creation in a physical realm. We will not be ghosts when we die. I mean, we will not uh, be forever disembodied. We will be embodied as resurrected people. And I had a man tell me one time a few years ago, I'll never forget this conversation. He was weeping because his daughter had died. His daughter really loved Jesus. Of course he was weeping and, and should weep. But when he looked at me, he says, I will never be able to hug my daughter again. I said, oh, yes, you will. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, look at me. Touch me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as I have. We will have flesh and bones in our resurrected body, and you will hug your daughter again, mm -hmm. and you will never be separated from her again by death. Mm -hmm. And that changes everything. Amen. Now, uh, two years ago, 2017, I'm packing my bag to fly to Philadelphia to play the Eagles on Monday Night Football. I get texts from my dad from, uh, telling me about his mom, that she wasn't doing well, she had a stroke. She's probably not going to make it. Hmm. And so I get on the bus with a heavy heart, fly into Philadelphia with a heavy heart, and I get into Philadelphia, get to my hotel room, and find out my grandma's gone. She passed away. And um, 
so I'm sitting there, it's Monday Night Football the next night, so I'm sitting there all day in my hotel room by myself on Monday, kind of processing this, understanding that I got to go play Monday night. My grandma's gone. Uh, I had a close relationship with her, and I reached out to you. And I just said, Randy, you know, I'm thinking of you in this moment with all I've studied about, you know, what you've taught me on heaven. Um, can you give me some encouragement? Can you give me some thoughts? And uh, one thing that was going through my mind that day was, will my grandma be able to watch me play tonight? Can you help me understand what Scripture says about people who have passed, loved ones in heaven, understanding, watching what's going on on earth? Would the Scripture give us an insight into that? It really does. In Revelation 6, you have martyrs. These are people who have died. They're with the Lord, and there's a dialogue taking place. And it says they look to the Lord and they say, Lord, how long before you will bring judgment upon those who murdered us? Now, that's a remarkable question. Because first of all, they remember that they were murdered. And you know, so some people say, well, wait a minute, you couldn't remember anything when you're in heaven about earth because if you did, it would make you sad and it wouldn't be heaven for you. Well, God knows everything that's happening. The angels see what's happening and it's still heaven for him. We're gonna have perspective, eternal perspective. And so we, that, they could handle the fact that they could remember being murdered. But what's really remarkable is that they say, how long, O oh Lord, before you bring judgment on those who murdered us? Meaning they know God hasn't yet brought judgment. So that means they know something about what is and is not happening on earth. You see in Luke 15 where uh, Jesus uh, is uh, telling people that for every, uh, that every time a sinner on earth repents, there is, and he puts it this way twice in Luke 15. It's the same passage. It's got the prodigal son in it. He says, every time a sinner repents on earth, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Now, he could easily have said, every time a sinner repents, the angels rejoice. But that's not his point. Otherwise, he just would have said it that way, the direct way. Who else lives in the presence of the angels besides God himself, who obviously rejoices when a sinner repents? Well, it's God's people who have died and gone to be with him. So every time this sinner repents on earth, people in heaven are rejoicing, which means people in heaven are seeing what is happening on earth. Now, that doesn't mean we see everything but it does mean that we see some things in whatever God wants them to see and would bring them pleasure to see. So I believe that it would bring your grandmother pleasure to see you play. I believe that it brought my mom and Nancy's mom pleasure to see their granddaughters, our daughters, married. They were married the same summer and both of our moms had already died and we thought, they're up there with Jesus, and I'll bet you it'd be just like him to just let them see mm -hmm. their, her, their beloved granddaughters get married. And, mm -hmm. and I think we should have that view and know that God will allow us to see anything there that would be an encouragement to us. That's good. Um, along the same lines, you know, when you, when you have a look in, as you alluded to, that, well, how can you have the, the perfection of heaven and see the imperfection of earth? Um, I've always struggled with how do I arrive in heaven expecting to, or hoping I should say, to see certain people there and then I realize they're not there. Mm. And, and then also um, the regret that will come with having eternal perspective and, and a different set of eyes and realize I missed it in some ways. Mm. In, the, in the big way I got it. But in some other ways, boy, I, I missed it. How do you deal with the regret or the pain over not seeing a loved one and yet still deal with the, the perfection, if you will, of heaven. Mm. How, what does scripture say about that? Or how do you reconcile that? Yeah, I, I think the main thing that we should do in that regard is to say, look, we're, if, we're by definition, we're talking about this here down on earth. And what it means is we still have opportunity to do something for the many loved ones that are still alive and the friends and the neighbors. And so I think it should inspire us to do what we can to close the gap between what we're actually doing and what one day we will wish we would have done. And I think the answer is to get an eternal perspective now that says, look, we're not gonna spend eternity mourning. We are going to spend eternity rejoicing. But at the same time, 
we need to realize that scripture says we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and God does care how we live. He does care whether we share the gospel with people. He, he, and it doesn't mean we have to be uptight and paranoid all the time. One of the things Nancy and I talk about is, look, you pray for the right opportunity to share with someone. If you feel like that opportunity didn't arise, you pray for them. You pray that their souls, that you pray that God would do a work of grace in his heart. We can't do it. There's nothing you and I can do other than be God's messengers and share with them and love them and reach out to them. But I would say, don't live life with an anticipation how, of how bad you're going to feel because you didn't share the Lord, because you didn't give generously, uh, because you didn't treat people right. No, look at those and say, this is my opportunity to treat people right, to give the way I should, and to share the gospel, and mm -hmm. take that perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, in the interest of time, I, I, there's a couple questions that I want to ask. Just because when I read the book, I was blown away by your insights. But in the interest of time, I wanted to be kind of rapid fire. So if you can give me as okay. quick an answer, succinct an answer as possible, that would help. Uh, what age are we going to be in heaven? I, I was hoping personally to be about 29. <laughs> okay, I'm 30 now. And, and you'll turn I, you know, 31 as an athlete, this summer. You kind of always get bigger, yeah. stronger, faster until about 27, 28, 29. Then you realize you start to kind of do this. So Yeah, I must be tough back in your what peak age there. I'm be. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, boy, in your 30s, man. It's a grind. But, yeah, you know, we all have, have a cross to bear. So, uh, but, uh, no, but seriously, I, I do get that. And we don't know the answer to that, but we do know that Aquinas, a great medieval theologian, his hypothesis is we'll all be the age that Jesus was when he died because he was at his peak. Well, that was probably around 33 years old, in which case you still got a few years. But, uh, but, but we don't know the answer to that, but we do know. Uh, that we will all have perfect bodies that will forever truly be us and yet be a perfected form of the bodies we have now. I'm an insulin dependent diabetic. I didn't have dessert tonight. I rarely have dessert. And boy, am I looking forward to having <laughs> dessert on the new earth. Amen. And I'm looking forward to being in a body that hasn't been affected by all those football hits. So, <laughs> um, we're going to be bored in heaven. You know, I always thought, you know, sitting on a cloud playing a harp. I'd rather go like play sports and do some other things. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't really appeal to me. Will we be bored in heaven? No, <laughs> I, we'll never be bored. Uh, and I know this for sure because God is not boring. And we will see his face and we will be with him. But then we're told in Revelation 22, his servants will serve him. Servants always have things to do, places to go, people to see. And there will be no drudgery in being a servant of God. We will love to go where he sends us. We will love to do what he has wired us to do and gifted us to do. Boredom on earth can happen now in life under the curse. There'll be no boredom, boredom in heaven. Um, okay, I die. How long until I'm in the presence of Jesus and in heaven? Is there any delay or passage of time or waiting or... No, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, Scripture says. Uh, Jesus looked the thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. No soul sleep, no delay. That's we good. go immediately. No purgatory. We go immediately into his presence. I find that to be a great comfort. All right, one that really matters to my wife. Will there be animals or are pets in heaven? Well, uh, I believe the answer definitely when you understand that the new earth is the future heaven, the clear biblical answer is for sure there will be animals. Isaiah 65 uh, talks about the new earth and it talks about animals on the new earth. It talks about the wolf lying down uh, and eating with the lamb, not eating the lamb, eating <laughs> with the lamb. And then in Isaiah uh, 11, it's got the cow and the bear together and it's got all of the... Uh, under the curse, these animals uh, didn't get along with each other and sometimes hurt people. There will be uh, animals on the new earth. Now, whether our pets will be among those is, uh, is another question. However, I, I believe that it makes perfect sense that the animals that God has entrusted to our care that have brought such great delight to us, since we know some animals will be brought back to life, which we know from Romans 8, where it says the whole creation groans in anticipation of the resurrection of God's children because the animal kingdom that fell on our coattails is going to rise on our coattail. Well, why wouldn't God include as some of those, these pets that have been so special to us? And we've had, Nancy and I have had uh, three dogs in our married life together. 
uh, a golden retriever, Maggie, that we have now, and Moses, uh, a Dalmatian, and Champ, a Springer Spaniel. And I have every reason to believe, and Nancy and I have talked about this, that we will be reunited with those pets in heaven because, again, if some animals are going to be alive, why not them? And doesn't God love to delight his children? And won't that be a, a delight for us? That's great. And you've had a, a golden doodle. And That's right. You Bentley. know, and goldens and yep. golden doodles, and there's a special place in heaven for those. We had, to pass Bentley off to a, uh, we had to pass Bentley off to a friend because he had a little bit of a nipping problem. But I'm excited to get him back in heaven without the nipping problem. With, without the <laughs> nipping problem. That'll be good. My brother's safe. Um, <laughs> One more question on heaven. I think it's really important in the interest of time. I'll be quick. But, you know, I'm always told, you know, you can't earn your way into heaven. Can't earn your way into heaven. Yeah. Salvation is a gift, free gift. Gospel, absolutely. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, obviously. But then there's this thing about rewards. And what you do with that, and what you, once you accept the gospel, and what you do with your life, there's going to be a reward system, if you will. You know, that, that kind of goes, a, not against, but it kind of is different than, than the message of the gospel. Can you help me understand that system of rewards, and, and then what will, what will those rewards be? And, and I feel like I, I need to be let in on this if it's going to matter for eternity, right. you know? Yeah, uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 8 and 9 is often quoted, and, and rightly so. And it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That of yourselves is the gift of God, not by works lest anyone should boast. But then, verse 10 goes right on to say... For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. Good works. So in other words, God is, which he prepared in advance for us to walk in. So God wants us to do good works. He's made us to do good works, and he will reward us for that. Well, I mean, what's Hebrews 11, 6? What does it say about what you have to believe about God? He, he who would honor God, please God, must believe that he is, and the second thing is, and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. God is a rewarder. And don't we like to reward our children for doing good things? Uh, God loves to reward his children. So how does that work? Uh, you don't work your way to heaven, but your works matter to the God once you are saved, and for sure you're going to heaven. He also wants you to please him with your works. What form those will take, we don't know. Sometimes they're called treasures in heaven. Uh, and one form they may well take is when Jesus says, you've been faithful in little, I'll put you over much. Mm. I'll, you'll rule over five cities, you'll rule over 10 cities. Nancy says, by the way, what she wants on the new earth is to live on water and be in charge of a bunch of dogs. So we'll see, you know. Go to West I, Michigan, it, join it, me and yeah. my wife. We'll do that too. Um, so kind of transitioning out of the heaven topic, um, you know, you wrote a book on happiness, you wrote a few books on happiness, and I'm at PAO last year in Tucson, and you give this talk on happiness that really, it, it, I mean, I've been in Bible class my whole life, my dad's a pastor, I'm a PK, and yet what you said, I, I said, I have never thought of that or heard that before, and that changes the game, and, and, and you, you know, so I, I go back to say, I hear the phrase all the time growing up. God doesn't call us to be happy. He calls us to be holy. What do you think? Is it wrong to want to be happy? I think the answer is it is not wrong to want to be happy. It is wrong to try to find happiness in sin. That, those are radically different things. And I, the reason I, I looked down some notes because I, I wrote down some passages uh, related to happiness. And just let me just read some. Be happy and full of joy because the Lord has done a wonderful thing. No, no false distinction between joy and happiness. It's just yeah. a happiness in God, a joy in God. Um, and uh, Psalm 40, 16, may all who seek you be happy and rejoice in you. Uh, Psalm 97, you are the Lord's people, so celebrate and praise the only God. Psalm 98, 4, shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth be happy, rejoice out loud. And then the final one I'll read is Isaiah 51, which actually brings us back to heaven. The people the Lord has freed will return and enter Jerusalem with joy. Their happiness will last forever. They will have joy and gladness and all sadness and sorrow will be gone far away. I think what we need to do and the message we need to send to our children is not God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy. It's God wants you to be 
holy and happy. And you won't be totally happy unless you're holy. And by the way, you won't be totally holy unless you're happy because God's word says we're supposed to be. We're supposed to find our happiness in Jesus. And we need to send this message to young people growing up in our churches, young people who go uh, to this school, all the young people in our lives, and in my case and Nancy's case, it's our grandkids that we're thinking about a lot. And we need to convey to them the God has wired you to want to be happy, but you won't find happiness in sin. You'll only find it in him, in giving to him, living for him, using your gifts for him, and bringing honor to him. And then that will fill your hearts with pleasure, gladness, happiness, joy. It's great. Two, two lines you said in that talk a couple of years ago is, God is by nature a happy God. Yes. He's up there happy. And two, Jesus is the happiest person who ever lived. So if those are the two examples of the nature, then absolutely, by all means, be happy, but just pursue it in the right way. Um, so, okay, thanks for hitting that. So I want to close with the stewardship thing because I think that's something that people know you for and, and obviously is so important. And I've, Julie and I have been wrestling with this as we've, uh, the Lord has blessed us in our football career financially in ways that have gone far beyond we ever thought possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've been wrestling with this, reading your, your material, and just you know, trying to Kirk, get understanding. You know, Kirk, if you combine my salary and yours, that's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Between the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> so in stewarding that a lot of money that yeah. you and I both you know, right. combined or have right. to steward, can you kind of talk about, just kind of broad strokes, what the Bible has to say about finding fulfillment, joy, and the abundant life through generosity, uh, kind of on that happiness topic. You know, one of the first things that comes to mind for me is, is Acts uh, chapter 20, verse 35. It's a unique verse. It's the only verse in the book of Acts that's attributed to Jesus that is not spoken in the Gospels. It's almost like God wanted to get one more word in from Jesus that you don't find in the Gospel narratives, and it's where it it says that, that Jesus said, it is more happy making to give than to receive. Now, why do, because you, you might go, well, what, doesn't it say it's more blessed to give than to receive? Yes, but that word is the Greek word makarios, and you look it up in any Greek English dictionary, that word means happy. In that particular case, it means happy making. In other words, to give to other people will make you happier than to receive. And now that is an amazing promise of scripture. And, and the joy that there is in that, and one passage that comes to mind is in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 where it says, and now brothers, uh, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Oh, oh, that's a staggering statement. They're in a severe trial, and yet they overflow with joy in the midst of their extreme poverty, which wells up in rich generosity. So happiness is not just something that makes wealthy people happy. It is something that makes poor people happy. And some of you have been in, how, how many of you have ever been uh, overseas in a missions context, either visiting or serving or a short-term missions trip, whatever it is? Every time we have experienced this, there's poor people who are sacrificing to fix the best meal they can possibly fix for you. And at first, it was just the idea of it just struck me as, oh, we shouldn't even receive this. And oh, no, 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 be a gracious receiver and just realize that these people are delighted to do this. They're finding joy and pleasure in doing this. So you can't say enough about how happy God is in his heart to give. God is by nature a giver. Uh, this passage in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, probably the strongest passage on uh, on giving in all of scripture, God's lightning, uh, God's grace is like lightning that strikes, 
our lives and then the thunder in response to his grace is our giving. God is a giver, we become like him when we give back. Mm -hmm. But it starts with his grace at work in our lives resulting in our giving back to him and what happens he gives us all the more grace we give all the more back to him and for the good of other people and it's a cycle of joy that is centered around giving that's great so one thing i feel convicted about is that while i know i should maintain a loose grip on things on earth and live for the the line and not the dot i feel in my flesh a desire to hold tightly to things on earth and to maintain control can you help me and, and help all of us keep a loose grip? What, what would you have to say as a little pep talk, as a coach, to say, you know, keep a loose grip and, and kind of help me understand how to do that? I think part of the, the key to this, and this is certainly something that you know, Kirk, uh, and have thought about, is, is just reminding yourself of the reality. God owns it all. Now, that is not just a cute little thing that we say. That is literally true. He owns it all. It all belongs to him, which makes us his property managers, his money managers. And so part of that managing his money is following his command to give and to give generously. And so that then allows us, how do you break the back of materialism? How do you learn to loosen your grip? Well, you learn to loosen your grip by loosening your grip, by actually giving and then seeing how, <clears throat> how it pays off, how happy it makes you, how healthy it is for your children in a materialistic society to learn how to give and the beauty and the wonders of giving and the Christ-likeness in giving and seeing the smile on somebody's face and, and what a pleasure it is to help other people. So we remind ourselves of the reality it all belongs to God, and then we remind ourselves of the reality too. We can't take it with us, but according to Matthew 6, and we saw that we can send it on ahead as, as treasures in heaven. Your treasures have mass, and my treasures have, that things have mass, and mass has gravity, and gravity will hold us in orbit around it. But every time we lessen the mass and invest it over here, our hearts follow our treasures and we let it loose because now we find something more exciting and that is the kingdom of heaven. Not our own personal kingdoms on earth, but the kingdom of heaven that we're investing our lives in. All of a sudden, when you get more happiness in doing that thing over there, it's easy to loosen the grip because... It's like, wow, why would I hang on to stuff I can't keep anyway when I could use it for eternal benefits? Good. Final question. Uh, when we were at the conference a couple of years ago, you said, the Bible gives us both bad news about giving and good news. I want to hear what the bad news and the good news is, but first, what's, what's the bad news about giving? Okay, uh, First uh, Timothy uh, chapter 6 uh, says this in, in verses 9 and 10. And first of all, in verse 7 and 8, it talks about contentment, about being content with what God has given us. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. And then it says this in verse 9, and this is actually a pretty stark warning uh, to us, because, by the way, we're all rich. You know, you, you're here tonight, you, you, you look at, go to globalrichlist.com sometime, not now, and put your, put your annual income into it, and you'll be shocked. Even if you think you're, oh, I'm just a middle class person, right, and that puts you in the 98th or 99th percentile of the wealthiest people in the world. Many of us here tonight are in the 99th percentile uh, along with Bill Gates, uh, you know, he just happens to be at the very top. And we maybe are at 99.1 or 99.2 or whatever it might be. But seriously, when you, we, you'll be shocked at where you come. So we're all rich, but here's what it says. It says people who want to get rich, now not just people who are rich or who have large incomes, but people whose life is about, their life go, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people 
into ruin and destruction. Are those, are any of those among your life goals? No. Well, that's what happens when you want to get rich. Well, you are going to fall into temptations and traps and, 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 and foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There's about nine statements there, any one of which should terrify us if we're going to live our lives with the love of money and, and be compelled by the desire for money, the driving force in our lives. Because those are all bad news, very bad news. The great thing is, later in the same chapter, God gives good news to rich people. And it's how to not fall victim to exactly what verses 9 and 10 of 1 Timothy 6 warn us about. And, and here it is. Command those who are rich in this present world, and as I said, it's all of us. Sure, differing degrees, but still, we are rich people. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, okay? Don't be arrogant. Like, don't think this is about me. Don't forget the advantages that you've received. If you grew up somewhere else in the world, even with the same raw natural talents, uh, you would not be able to turn it into the kind of wealth that is customary in this part of the world. Don't be arrogant. That isn't about you. That is just a gift of God's provision. Warn them not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth. Do not hope in wealth. Wealth will always let you down. It will not uh, bring you the fulfillment, the happiness, the joy, uh, the meaning, the purpose in life that you want. Um, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Wealth is uncertain here today, gone tomorrow. Either your treasures will be separated from you, or you will be treasure, uh, separated from your treasures. There, on earth, th there's, there's not any permanent relationship between the two of you. But to put their hope in God, who is certain. See, this worldly wealth, we can't take it with us. God, it's, it's uncertain, but God is certain. So put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And this is a beautiful thing that he would say that in the midst of this passage. He provides us everything for our enjoyment. And that has really helped me. We recently had a family uh, vacation together in a beautiful, wonderful place, and we were out snorkeling, and I'm with my kids and grandkids and my wife, and, and I'm saying, Lord, thank you. I am worshiping you out here. Did it cost us some money to get here? Yes, it did. By God's grace, uh, we give away 100% of the royalties from all my books, and I say that not to boast, but to say there's nothing that would make us more happy when people say, look, you just, your books have sold like 11 million copies now. Uh, do, do you know what you could do with that money? And I go, nothing that would bring us anywhere near as much joy as the joy that we have as a result of having given it away and invested in God's kingdom and knowing that lives are being changed as a result of it. But I feel so good that God says in the middle of all this, he's given us everything for our enjoyment. It's okay to have a good meal like we had tonight. It's okay to enjoy the beauties of this world that God has created for us as long as we're doing what verse 18 says, Command them, command the rich in this world to do good, to be rich in good deeds. That's the greatest kind of wealth, those good deeds that God has called us to do. To be rich in good deeds and to be generous and to be willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. And that's, he clearly is thinking of what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not, not on earth. Take, take the earthly treasures and then turn them into heavenly treasures by giving them now while you still have a chance to make a difference in people's lives. And, but I love the way it ends because it's not just making a promise about eternity. 
eternal rewards, it says, so that they may take hold. This is present tense. That they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Not this cheap imitation of life, like just accumulate, accumulate, make it all about me. Uh, no, not that's not the good life. The good life, the life that is truly life, is the, lo the love of God that demonstrates itself in love for people and service for God and honoring God and helping people. And that will not only result in your eternal welfare of treasures in heaven and seeing people and meeting people at, at, at banquets who say, thank you for giving because you gave, I heard the gospel, because you gave. My children were fed and lived, and they heard the gospel. Not only that, but right here and now, you will be taking hold of the life that is truly life. I mean, the life that's worth living, what Jesus called the abundant life. I have come that you might have life, and you have it more abundantly. This is not prosperity theology. It's not God owes you, and he's going to, give you, if you do this for him, he's going to give you all this wealth and you can be, bury yourself in it. No, this is the promise of God. Grab hold of the life that is truly life. How? By keeping? No, by being, unclenching those fists and opening up your hands and giving to the world to the glory of God and for the good of people. And that's what it means to really live. Thank you, Randy. That's outstanding. Mm. You know, uh, in the football world, I'm always looking for teammates who are about substance, not about flash. You get a lot of guys about flash. You know, they get drafted, they buy a sports car, they post on social media how awesome they are. You know, they do everything to kind of self-promote, all about flash. Then they go out there and they can't catch the ball. They can't get open. <laughs> they can't make a tackle. You know, there's no substance to this guy. He's all flash. Get him out of here. You know, and quite frankly, you know, yeah, you get the guys who are both. They're substance and flash. But really, I really want the guys who really aren't trying to be flashy. They're just substance. It's just, that guy just comes in and works every day. It's not about him. He makes every play. Nobody, you know, really knows it, notices it. He doesn't care. He just keeps going to work. Uh, when I got around Randy, and, you know, you meet people in, in my world. You meet people who, who, you've, who you've followed from a distance. And then you meet them, and you really get to know who they really are. Well, I got the chance to do that after reading Randy's book and following him. I get to meet him. And I walked away after a couple conferences going, I said to Julie, that guy's about one thing, substance. You look at his Bible, that's substance. His knowledge of scripture, who he is, his giving away of his royalty. He sold 11 million copies. You can do the math on what royalty checks would be on that. The guy's about substance. And he, he, he's not flashy, no offense. But he's not flashy. Wait a minute. But he's about substance. Was I substance. just insulted? I and that's why I wanted him here. And I think in West Michigan, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of substance. It doesn't have to be about the flash. And that's why, you know, my wife and I have made this home, and we're going to raise our kids here. It's because of that. We want our kids raised in that. Amen. And this school is about that. And, uh, and so we believe in that. You know, and I'll just close by saying, um, you know, I was watching a, a sports movie a little while back, Moneyball. And Brad Pitt's the main actor. It's a good movie about the, uh, the athletics baseball team. Brad Pitt the, plays the character managing the team. And they have a new way of evaluating talent. And nobody else in professional baseball uses it. So they're kind of pioneers. And everyone makes fun of them for doing it. But they don't really have a choice. They have to do it. They have to find a way to be different. So they, they, they kind of, they start doing it, but they don't really commit. They don't dive in. And the assistant who Brad Pitt has hired to basically be his go-to man on this new way of doing things is uh, believing in it, but he even is a little afraid of going all in. And Brad Pitt sits down with him. He says, do you believe in this thing or not? Like, I hired you. We said we're going to do it, but we're kind of tiptoeing in it. Do you believe in it or not? And, and Jonah Hill's the actor, and he, he looks at Brad Pitt, and he says, 100%. And, he, and Brad Pitt looks back at him and says, then what are we doing? And he then proceeds to make a bunch of phone calls, cutting players who would go against conventional wisdom, but go with the uh, 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 system they're setting up, and then signing players who no one else wants, but fit the program they're trying to develop. And everyone looks at them like they're idiots, and how foolish and stupid. Well, they, and they then go on to finish the season, they win 20 games in a row. And, and it changes baseball, and now the Red Sox and the Yankees and all the big money teams are doing it their way. And it's in that moment where he had to decide, do we believe in this thing or not? Because if we do and we're going to take it seriously, let's go all in. And if, if it's not true, then let's just stop dabbling with it, and let's go back to doing it the way everybody does it and kind of just blend in. 
And I was convicted when I heard that because I think that's, that's giving and that's stewardship. If you read the Bible and Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive, do you believe it or not? Because if you believe it, let's give it away. Let's go all in. And let's double down and live for the line, not the dot. And, and if, if you don't believe it, then let's not dabble with two, three, four percent of our giving and try to appease God and keep him happy and go on with our life and, and indulge. You know, we're either all in or we're not. And, and so I've always used that as kind of a conviction for me. And I would just leave that with you to say, you know, do we really believe in this thing? And if we do, then what are we doing? And, and let's go all in. And, um, you know, for me and my perspective, specifically related to this school, I believe after having an experience at this school that was that transformational in my life, I get emotional talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, this should be the number one school in the country. I believe that. Hmm. And um, many of you in this room have given to make it what it is. So thank you. I'll just say this. The Bible is very clear that God honors those who give. And... Uh, when you partner with God's heart in a place like this school, God is honored. Mm. And uh, yeah. Randy, I'm a little emotional, so could you close in prayer? Oh, man. <laughs> Thanks for sharing from your heart. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much. Uh, Lord, your presence here is very real. Um, thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit and the life of my brother and the life of my brothers and sisters that are sitting out here those who teach at this school, those who ad administer and serve in secretarial roles and custodial roles and in everything else that makes um, this school what it is. Thank you that this is like a microcosm. This is happening all over the world. You're faithful people being faithful to your calling and to your gifting. And Lord, I pray for your blessing upon this school and the students and the families and the community. We pray for greater things than ever before. Thank you for the impact, uh, not only in Kirk's life, but in countless other lives uh, of this place, and pray for your blessing upon it. And pray that you would move the hearts of your people to give generously, to support this church, to support good churches and good missions works and community projects and everything else, Lord. Thank you that you desire to bring us joy through bringing you honor through giving with our whole hearts. Thank you for the grace of Jesus. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. We praise you in his name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Randy for being here? Thank you.